Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, one of the things which I, I, I thought was to be mentioned was the, uh, the recipient's uh, CVP at the time of transplantation has a very important bearing on, on the uh, graft dysfunction. Uh, I think Dr. Bala has also done some extensive work on that. And if you look at the scoring uh, system for predicting primary graft dysfunction, uh, there's something called a radial score, where, where there is a large amount of uh, weightage given to the recipient CVP. Any, anything you want to add on that? Sorry, sir, I don't know. Dr. Bala, you want to tell something? Yeah, you talk now. Any other questions on the, on the presentation? What of death in the donor? Did it have any relationship in the PG? Uh, the first case you showed, what uh, do you know the... Uh, uh, the Rotary head head injury. You know. uh, there was there was no IC blade. I think. How many uh, desensitization have you had to do in your experience? You have uh, in pediatrics, uh, we have done, but in adults, uh, we have done desensitization. Almost two patients we have done. But uh, uh, desensitization were they females or previous surgeries? What was the reason for the sensitization? Uh, they had blood transfusion before uh, transplantation. So PRA was almost 80%. We did uh, desensitization with uh, initially with rituximab and then plasmapheresis. And uh, before transplantation, we did a virtual cross match and uh, virtual cross match physically we could not do. Physically, uh, we get the sample, but the result we uh, usually get after we get the result after the transplantation only. But you were able to get the donor HLA before the transplant. Right? We have uh, policy as a protocol. We get donor HLA, donor uh, blood for the CMV, and donor blood for the culture. No, but how how yeah. fast can you get the report? Uh, last uh, uh, when we get uh, la in I remember the last time we had got the retrieval uh, when the, we took the patient inside the uh, donor took the patient inside the OT we got the HLA report. So I think uh, if you add the SAB of the recipient and the donor HLA profile, we can do virtual cross match. May not the lab does it so fast because it's getting the donor HLA profile is almost difficult. Less than sort of yeah, it takes hard, I think four hours. Which lab yeah. does it for you, sir? Labs I don't know, but last no, time no, we got the, a. The, the real thing yeah, is uh, for the, if you're running one cycle for that particular donor, mm -hmm. it takes four hours. Mm -hmm. The problem is most of the labs will uh, do it after they get all the other uh, okay. you know, kidney samples and everything else. So they don't run a cycle for, the, for us itself. If you tell the lab you have to run it for us separately, you can get that done. But it, that's, all, that's all the time it takes, but just that they delay it before for other reasons. Any other questions? So can we go on to the next talk, Dr. Bala? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a last minute substitute for Anway, so, um, and there's not, um, I should briefly give my ideas about this. Is it? Okay. Um, so I don't think this was touched upon in this entire, actually very put, very well put together session. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone listening. But um, anyway, uh, over the last decade, even though this transplant business started way back in the mid nineties, we did our first transplant in 1996. And then till the year 2010, we had done a grand total of three. So I think only the last decade there has been a considerable improvement in the organ donation, but one sobering and fairly interesting statistic, for those who care to look at this, if you draw a line across the middle of this country from Gujarat from the West Coast to the East Coast of Vishakhapatnam, 95% of organ donations happen south of that line. Something uh, to, to think about. Uh, the current realities are a majority are sick, Intermax one, two or three. I think the Intermax was covered by 
Dr. Jennifer. Uh, high creatinine is very common, as is high bilirubin and high per pulmonary vascular resistance. All these long-term valves are uh, of no use to us as a bridge. ECMO and Centrimag are the mainstay. Pediatric organs are scarce, and both pediatric and adult transplants are pretty much done by the same team. I'm not sure of any pediatric exclusive surgeons who are into transplants in this country. Perhaps not. Uh, this again, I think, was shown by Julius. The number of transplants done worldwide. Um, most centers do very few. And this is our uh, thing over the last decade. 20 and 21 were uh, because of COVID. This year, we're back, I think, already this year from January. We've done 72 transplants totally out of them. I think close to a good sizable number is pediatric. Recipient age is another thing. Majority of donors in those in North America are children. Here, uh, we have to take older donors because of the uh, sheer necessity of it. Uh, majority are DCM. We have uh, a few restricted cardiomyopathies and a quarter of them are congenital heart disease. Donors to recipient weight ratio is again very important. Uh, SHLT, the majority are one to 1.5 and less than two. NOTO has the policy of allotting hearts from pediatric donors to pediatric recipients, definition less than 18. Older and bigger hearts are very commonly used because of the challenges of MCS in this country. Uh, since the recipient hearts are often significantly large, except for very small children, fitting an oversized heart is possible. The problem is in failing frontal tube to PLE with multiple previous procedures where the heart is not enlarged, and some patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy, where this can be a big challenge. Uh, when we looked at our recipient to donor ratios, it was skewed to the right much more than the ISHLT data. And um, this has been Ganapati is already um, focused on this. So when you want, want to set up a transplant program, uh, most of the units that we have helped, and we have, I think over 100 units from across the world have come to visit us. Majority do one or two, get into the newspaper in terms of India and then go back to their usual work. So that's not setting up a transplant program. That's why, in fact, I was talking to Julius. The number of units in this country which do more than 15 transplants of the heart per year is perhaps two or three, not more. And the number of units which do more than 15 lung transplants is two or three for the size of 1.6 billion, that's sobering. And such a beautifully put together program the, uh, the audience is not much, but take heart because next week I'm in speaking in CSI, uh, and perhaps Julius is, where the audience would be even less. <laughs> so uh, again, since um, the, in this very city two years ago, in the same, uh, in the, I think the CSI was in Calcutta, two or three years back, the full session on pediatric, I mean, on adult transplantation, and the three speakers were me and I think uh, Ranjit John from Minneapolis, another OOC speaker. So I was the first speaker. So they requested me to stay back, said, we listen to your talk. So you owe it to us to listen to all. So it's a tragedy because it's such a right, rich scientific content. So have an MCS program with adequately trained surgeons, professionals, and anesthesiology, critical care. This is crucial because especially if everyone highlighted the challenge of patients dying on a waiting list. So we have a team of, I think, almost 25 critical care anesthesiologists who run the program. And each one of them is capable of initiating ECMO. So we have a very large ECMO program. In fact, we have an ECMO ICU with about 25 beds. So during COVID, we had uh, simultaneously running close to 30 ECMOs. So even today, at any point in time, we'll have seven or eight patients on ECMO and uh, two or three would be children. So, you really, and it can't be done by one surgeon or one physician because it's, then you don't have a life. Uh, so uh, train critical care people are crucial. Everyone can be trained. So that is an important, uh, and professionals, and they have to be on call. That means if there's a cardiac arrest, the only way you can ever get them to live is somebody's in the hospital and quickly able to reach them and do the required. The next is transportation. Uh, Dr. Balan spoke about adjusting operating room. That's a luxury when we start, when I did my first transplant in this country, just an operating room. So today it's a rarity. Today's a rarity for us to get it from our city. 
95% of our organs are long distance. We come to Maharashtra very often. Three times a month, we go to Chandigarh. And that's not easy because we take commercial flights, hop off from Delhi, go to Chandigarh, come back. So ischemic trams are through the roof. So you need a very good logistics department. Sometimes you get five donors in a day. So if you're going to take all five of them, you really need a bench strength of people who can organize this. Uh, inner city traffic is bad in every city. Chennai city was the first to start this green corridor business. This is an example. This is in Vijayawada in the month of May. The outside temperature is 48 degrees. We are going in this car, going to Guntur Airport. People are throwing flowers. So the true heroes are the organ donors and these simple folks. So it's very humbling, actually, because here we all talk big about HLA and reduction. These people have nothing to do about it. So organ donation works. So the people of this country, in my opinion, uh, do the good thing if everyone uh, actually does it. So, so interestingly, uh, there's a girl from Bombay that we, we did in 200, 2014. So for some reason, Times of India got hold of it, became a national news and international news. And I think Canada and BBC covered it. And this is a young girl, Hawaii. So uh, she was a pediatric patient at that time. She grew up, she's about to get married. She became a transplant coordinator. And as a consequence, um, the organ donation really picked up, pediatric, the cadaveric donation in this country picked up around 2014 to a large extent because of uh, this kind of positive coverage. So um, the other challenge is transporting patients. So once you start a program, patients will be airlifted to you from across the country and perhaps from other country. Uh, air ambulance in this country are a joke. They're meant for um, politicians and others to campaign on elections. So they have a narrow door. So you can't even take a patient up on a stretcher because there's no term space to turn. Uh, all of you who are trained in the United States, a lot of those people who spoke from Michigan, it's for as far as we are concerned, Michigan is farther from Mars. So it's a, it has no contextual reality that we can relate to. So when we first started this business, uh, we got an organ from PGI Chandigarh, the month of May, temperature 48 degrees centigrade. The ambulance is not air conditioned. The patient was in a balloon pump, the balloon stopped working because uh, um, the, the companies which build these um, uh, are meant for very cold ambient temperatures. They've never heard of temperature of 50 degrees. So then the aircrafts don't have a plug point. They have a plug point. There's only one plug point. It's like a dynamo. The electricity comes on only half, half an hour after the flight takes off. So all the infusion pumps stop. So uh, Dr. Murali was our anesthetist. One of these patients uh, had a cardiac arrest in the airspace over Delhi. So they got up to massage and the plane is tilting. And this is not made up. This is a true story. So they had to go back to Chandigarh. They can't land in Delhi because no hospital is willing to certify a patient who died in the air. No hospital is certi willing to certify a patient who died. So what are we supposed to do? And then the insurance wouldn't. So I had to physically go to Chandigarh to sort it out. So I'm merely telling you the kind of challenges which have to be overcome to, for this to become a reality. We transport patients on ECMO all the time, especially during COVID became a uh, very big problem. So uh, we have the longest airlift for a uh, on a VA ECMO has been from the middle of Siberia over an 18 hour flight. So we use ambulances, we use uh, aircrafts and we use trains. These are pretty good actually, and they're quite inexpensive. The patient's not on a ventilator. This is an adult, but he could use it for a child. And the railways actually runs a intensive care unit in the train, which costs a fraction of what it will cost you in a flight. So it's a good thing to do. Uh, I think Ganapati spoke about we time our cross clamp uh, by looking at the real time picture of the flight, because as I said, 90% of our organs are from long distance. So we need a surgical anesthetic team to fly out, assess and harvest and bring back. Sometimes we have, it's, it's a strange thing, for two weeks you don't have an organ and suddenly one day you'll have five. And uh, you have to take all because you don't know when the next crop will come. So you really need a bench strength to be able to do this. So we put the box in, uh, again, this has become routine. When we first started, the size of the box was not standardized. So it has to go through the x-ray and the first one was too high, it couldn't go through the x-ray. So they wouldn't let us take these organs. So we had to actually open the box, show that it's a 
uh, again, this is not even science fiction. This is stupid science fiction, but this is reality. So we had to buy a ticket. Uh, we buy it in the name of the patient uh, and keep it next to ourselves. And uh, this is a young recipient of a heart lung transplant. Matter of fact, from rural Maharashtra has done well. So in the end, all this is worth it because somebody actually lives. We, uh, we published this uh, in the General Heart Lung Transplant Commercial Airlines as a viable, safe, effective. It's actually, it was unknown in the Western world that somebody would use a commercial airline to transport an organ. But um, in this country, we, it's called a jugod in Hindi, I guess. So the next uh, big elephant in the room is cost. Um, it's easy to talk about LVAD and RVAD and HLA and everything. Everything costs money. If somebody's sick and waiting in the intensive care, every day's cost is close to 100,000 rupees. So you need to develop a mechanism for funding these patients. So we did a costing analysis of 163 consecutive heart transplants in an Indian setting. This is the first large study on costing compared to outcomes and we divided into consumable lab laboratory costs, uh, radiology and diet and so on and so forth. We found some interesting things. The, if, if you die, the cost of treatment is more. That is, all of us know that. Cost, death is expensive. So one of the most compelling reasons to have survivors is to avoid cost if nothing else. Number two is if you were to die within seven days of surgery, the cost is manageable. If you die beyond seven days, the cost goes through the roof. So that's a huge dilemma we face when you do all these exotic things is in a middle-class family, which is, which is hard pushed to support even this, are you better off uh, shutting up everything so that the other child can live well? Or are you gonna push them into poverty and then have this patient die at the end of two months? So these are horrible choices to make. So we did a logistic regression of um, the odds ratio of which patients, and also we found that the cost clearly is higher, longer the hospitalization is. So what are the risk factors for longer hospitalization and death? One is high creatinine, the other is intermax category. So do, does it mean that the hospitals which should include that in their um, costing and their packages? So that ahead of time, you tell them, look, your patient has X3, three, four, five risk factors. So the duration of, uh, of hospitalization is likely to be more. So we have to charge you more. But we, that would be the most logical way, but logic never works in this country. So anyway, we came up with a round figure of 14, around 15 lakhs is the cost of doing the operation. This is not the build amount. So this cost is true whether you did the transplant in, in the Bridge Candy or in Wadia Children's Hospital or any other government hospital. So this is important because in the, in the scheme of these things where you have Aishman, Bharat and insurance, everyone talks about packages as like a Thali meal. Unfortunately, it is not. And none of these rates which are fixed by these governmental agencies is based on any reality of costing studies. So I'm, I'm astonished that we are talking about sending a manned aircraft to the moon and we have not do done this simple study. We've not even done a costing study of how much it costs to have a child treated in intensive care with one day. All of you would remember the uh, platelet, um, the dengue episode of a patient who died in Fortis. I was in Fortis at that time. That created a national scandal in my opinion, that was one of the, uh, perhaps the camel straw which led to that empire collapsing. The, the bill was 16 lakhs for a child. So they said, how can a mosquito bite cost 16? It's not a mosquito bite. A child was in renal failure, had low platelets. So not a single person, and a lot of medical doctors came on stage, not a single person spoke about the realistic cost of healthcare. The, uh, the rivalry of hospital change was an evident phase. They said we would have charged less. So, as a group, we are failing ourselves. And that's the comparative figure of healthcare transplant costs. Ours is the lowest and actually we have comparable outcomes. So, so we took this data to our state. Um, all governments are, uh, are we, we curse them, we fight with them all the time, but eventually they're the only ones who can actually make a difference. And uh, they fund that they, in our state, we get 16 lakhs for a heart, 22 lakhs for a lung and 25 for a heart and lung transplant no matter how poor they are. So it's, it may or may not meet the entire cost with something. It's something to work with. So, the, and especially this is a social context because uh, most of the organs are from poor people who are walking on the streets. So how can you take an organ from them and never give it back to them? And government hospitals, unfortunately, don't have the infrastructure even though they try once in a while. 
except for all India Institute to actually carry these out. So this is the beginning. Aishman Bharat has not yet accepted it. I'm trying my best to get it done. So next we come to the role of funding agencies. So we started a trust, it's called Aishwarya Trust. They have funded close to 125 transplants, not incomplete, but partially, and some of them incomplete. So it's huge because even um, rich patients become poor in this country if you have major health issues. Uh, I'll skip this. So what are the outcomes? It's important to monitor outcomes. And I've been a, a surgeon in this country, cardiac surgeon for the last 40 years. All of us have done thousands of, uh, of tetralogies and fontans and um, CABGs and mitral valve placements. We've not, I've not had a Kaplan Michael or 15 year follow up in our own practice in this country because follow up has been difficult. And here comes the whammer. In transplants, it's possible for one reason. One is it's a late, this kid is a late entrance to the game. So by the time transplants became a reality, uh, everyone had a mobile phone, internet connection. Uh, that was a good thing. And anyone who gets a transplant will call you, even if he has a mosquito bite, all of us. You all. So the smallest thing, even the treating doctor doesn't want to get involved in this. So our follow-up is pretty much 100%. So uh, unlike uh, in a, a stand, they go to another hospital and die or get something done. You don't know what happens to them. So you need to have a dedicated team for data collection and maintenance. That, in my opinion, is crucial because we have, we have climbed several mountains of you're now doing uh, neonatal switches with 2% mortality or whatever. But all of our data is operative survival and resting phases. That has to change. So we need our own data. So one of the things which at least helped me during the COVID times was it gave us a time from break from the frenetic pace at which we operate to actually sit down, collect data, organize it. And I learned statistics. I actually bought data and R. I took classes. So coming to outcomes, uh, we've done close to 500 and odd transplants, out of which 116 have been pediatric transplants. We published a bit of it. Very briefly, this is the age distribution. The youngest has been six months, seven months. Uh, our 10 year survival is now 65%. I'm not sure how it compares with Toronto or Michigan, but it's certainly better than the adult survival, which is close to 50%. It compares favorably with the ISHLT data of around that. So, uh, and this is 100% follow-up. They have not missed any death. So we looked at the risk factors for 90-day mortality because uh, you can't get late survival if you don't get early survival. So this is a forest plot. We found, I mean, you can understand lower intermax or functional class has to be a poor risk. We found high atrial pressure or high pre-transplant um, venous pressures to be a major risk factor. I had not noticed it. Ganapati was working with me for a long time, noticed and said, why do patients with big ascites not do very well after transplant? I hadn't, I hadn't really noticed that. Um, you know, and so then it, it set my mind thinking. I went back and did a lot of work. We found that the organ perfusion pressure, which is the difference between the mean pressure and the right atrial pressure indexed to the body surface area, if it's less than 40, it's a risk factor for poor outcomes across all sizes of body sizes. Ischemic time is bang in the middle. They actually didn't figure our longest ischemic time increasingly are close to uh, six to seven hours. The longest has been eight and a half hours. Again, as I said, there's a selection bias because we only choose patients who are young donors with good hearts. So that may or may not work. And high creatinine has been a risk factor for both adults and children. So we did this, um, this is a logistic reg regression map. It's called a margins plot. It's a very, very good facility in, a, in the stator which lets you do this. So we, uh, we found that high, can I continue for a few more minutes? Uh, we found that a high right atrial pressure is a risk factor for uh, mortality, provided the arterial elastance is low. That means if you're very vasodilated, I, I'll come to that. And there are ways in which you can calculate, calculate the arterial elastance from commonly derived hemodynamic parameters that we get in the uh, cardiac catheters in laboratory. So on the medium term follow up, again, poor into max, you would imagine, expect that. We found even at, at, at five years and 10 years in adults, a low organ perfusion pressure index to the body surface area is a risk factor for like log rank of 0 0.007. And again, uh, high RA pressure with a low uh, arterial elastance is a risk factor. And donor age is important in pediatric transplants. Uh, younger donors have much better survival, log rank 0 0.05 as compared to older donors. And Ganapati spoke about this. We have a U-shaped curve, which actually is surprisingly similar to what the ISHG says. 
uh, in terms of weight category, uh, lower weight less than one and weight less more than 3.5 are high risk for survivors. So we then developed a research team. I think all of us should do this because uh, if you want to be taken seriously internationally, you really have to have data. So we developed, a, um, uh, we hired two, uh, the trust that we run helped us hire two full-time data people who actually collect the data, validate it and enter it. And we developed a research team to make sense of the large amount of data we generated. So one of the important questions we asked was, the, it's well known both in adult and pediatric heart failure that the onset of right ventricular dysfunction is a risk factor for mortality in uh, heart failure, why? And does a high pre-transplant venous pressure affect post-transplant survival? So I, uh, I worked with the uh, engineering design group on my faculty there. So we did a mathematical model of the human cardiovascular system, uh, uh, 1D model, including battery receptors and developed virtual pressure volume loops to the right and left ventricle. And all of you know the basis of medical treatment, the uh, arterial elastins versus the and systolic elastance is the ratio of ventricular arterial coupling. And you lower the arterial elastance to improve ventricular contractility and ventricular dysfunction. So when we started doing this, um, as you can see, the blue color graph is the normal ventricular function. And the yellow is the ventricular dysfunction. As you would expect, it shifts upwards and to the right. And the small, tiny um, pygmy in the middle is the red curve. That's without barrier receptors. So we actually are alive because barrier receptors vasoconstrict and increase the heart rate. And interestingly, we had two excellent lecture, lectures in medical treatment. Medical treatment of heart failure actually opposes what barrier receptors do. We slow down the heart rate with beta blockers and we vasodilate what the vasoconstricting uh, barrier receptors try, try, try to do. The next panel shows you the difference between isolated left ventricular dysfunction, which is the yellow curve, and the red one. So ventricular, biventricular dysfunction patients are much sicker. And the one on the left shows you the reason why if you, if you take vasodilators for adults, most of us with normal hearts, I presume, all that would happen is the blood pressure will become lower. But if you have heart failure, your stroke volume increases it's because the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship curve is flatter. Uh, again, uh, till you actually are involved in this research work, you read this in your physiology or textbooks, it doesn't register. So what we then did, and this might be interesting for all of you, we took a 12-year-old boy, Sai uh, Anepu, um, I think Ganapati might perhaps remember him. We took his data, he was done I think four or five years ago, and this I did last month. So I took it into the program. So um, he became a virtual patient in the program. And we virtually restored his right ventricular function to normal. We can do that. You can just change the arterial ventricular elastic of the right ventricle. And immediately, what do you notice? You notice that the stroke volume increases the cardiac output increases, the mean aortic pressure increases, the RA pressure comes down, and the left ventricular elastance goes, uh, comes down. So these are, so basically patients with biventricular dysfunction are sicker. They have lower stroke volume, they have lower cardiac outputs, and their VAC ratios are high. So I wanted to see whether that's, that correlates with the clinical data. So we compared patients with high and low RA pressure. And actually, I've drawn the p-values in the bottom. The patients with higher CVP, have, uh, have uh, lower cardiac output, lower stroke volume, uh, higher EA, and their organ perfusion pressure is lower. Then we took a patients with high CVP or high RA pressure more than 15, categorized by lower arterial elastins and higher arterial elastins. Something very interesting. When you vasodilate these patients, look at the improvement in cardiac output, it becomes 2.8. So vasodilator works, the stroke volume increases, the cardiac output increases. So all this is not theory. It actually happens in our patients. But what's the downside? The organ perfusion pressure drops very drastically. So it's a, it's, it's a bargain. What you gain in terms of cardiac output and stroke volume, you lose. So when you're referring cardiologists, and the blood pressure is not very different from the two groups. So my lesson for both adult and pediatric is when you give these wonderful new drugs, the cubic to the sultan and all that, all that we're monitoring is only the systolic blood pressure. And we say we have a target of 100 as long as that's not, we're not monitoring the venous pressure. You could, uh, I guess, looking at the IVC. You're certainly not monitoring the organ perfusion pressure. So we found that this, if this value drops below 40, regardless of the age and size, it's got a deleterious effect. Uh, functional outcomes have been excellent. A lot of people have referred to that. 
the girl to my left was actually trekking in the mountains of Munnar two years after transplant, after being in ECMO. This girl is playing tennis. So uh, this boy actually was in Ukraine. He played football for the national soccer team, though I don't know whether he's alive or dead now with all that bombing. So in conclusion, excellent long-term outcomes are possible in this country, even such a resource-constrained country like ours. It's truly a team effort. Uh, a surgeon alone is useless. Organ initiatives are needed. We just started a program in our children's hospital in our city uh, to start organ donation and more affordable wells are needed. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I exceeded the time. <laughs>